Thank you, Parvani, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming back after lunch. I know perhaps it's not the best of the times, and we might be a bit of sleepy, sleepy but hopefully you all got coffee. Uh, so to, a bit of a disclaimer before I get started. What I'm presenting today is not the type of work that I would typically talk about in terms of uh, acquisition or some of the things I've done with Japanese, English, Spanish, trilinguals. But instead, I've decided to present this as a kind of methodological footnote so something that I've been thinking about quite a bit since I did my PhD and a reviewer pointed out uh, in one of the reviews, and I'll, I'll discuss that in a second. Before that, I also want to acknowledge, of course, that this is not work I've done by myself. I need to acknowledge my collaborators, Adele Chao-Jorozko, who's at the Polytechnic University of Hong Kong, Hong Liu, who's a Xiaotun Liverpool University in Shanghai, and Fernando Martin Villena, who's a PhD student at Universidad de Granada. So this is work I've done with them. So what I want to do today is I want to explore how the Lextel has been used in, SLA, in the SLA literature. And I want to assess its validity, its validity as a measure of global, gen, or global L2 proficiency. I'll, and I will unpack that in a little bit. So I think that, and it goes without saying, that the role of proficiency in SLA has been central across paradigms, irrespective of what you're interested in. We all talk about proficiency. And perhaps we could do a very quick exercise and you could perhaps raise your hand if you've discussed or thought about the proficiency of your participants at some point in your studies. I certainly have, and perhaps most of you have, as I was kind of expecting. Some people have, however, been interested in understanding what proficiency means and operationalizing it, right? That's something that some people have done, just to name a few here. But some others, like myself, for example, have used the concept of proficiency to explain some of the variants or some of the things we see in our studies, or well, at least to make sure that our groups are comparable. So we've used the proficiency as a kind of a factor in our studies, even if we're not interested in proficiency per se. And that's, in fact, what, I, what I've done, some of us have done, and what I want to explore today. So to date, there are four systematic reviews, at least to the best of my knowledge, that have examined how SLA researchers have operationalized the notion of proficiency in their studies. And that's for people who are not interested in proficiency per se, but using proficiency as a predictor in their work. And I just, uh, I've just screenshotted here a, a very nice table taken from Park et al. 2021, very recently published on language learning, that kind of summarizes the finding of the first three systematic reviews. The one by Thomas in 1994 did a, a systematic review of how people had used or operationalized proficiency. And what they did find is that out of the studies that they were reviewed, 157 in total, only 36.3% of those studies had actually used independent measures of proficiency in the studies. Thomas 26, I, 20, uh, 2006, a kind of follow-up study with similar methodology found again a, a similar rate of operationalization of proficiency as an independent measure. We see that uh, they found a rates of 42.6% and with different uh, types of proficiency kind of measures. Tremblay 2011, in a kind of, again, a follow-up, not a direct follow-up, but a chronological follow-up, did a similar study, reviewed 144 studies, and found, again, a similar rate of operationalization of proficiency, 36.8%. Uh, again, you can see different categories of proficiency or different measures of proficiency that were used. Park and colleagues in 2021 very recently followed up on these previous reviews and, uh, and looked at what had been done in the last 10 years, from 2012 to 2019. And what they did find after examining 500 uh, studies in a systematic way was that 91.2% of studies reported L2 proficiency, which is quite indicative of the fact that we all talk about proficiency in our studies, right? Importantly, however, 25% uh, of these studies use, used multiple measures. For example, uh, some uh, used uh, one or more regional simplified sections of uh, existing standardized proficiency tests. Others used closed tests, oral tests, vocabulary tests, and other independent tests. So within the studies that actually talk about proficiency, there's quite a, a bit of variation as to the measures that are actually used. And then there were also some non-independent measures. What I do want to highlight is that out of these 91.2% of studies that use or talk about proficiency, 
only 42% of those use independent measures, objective, so-called objective measures, right? Which uh, already uh, gives us a lot of food for thought. And in a way, if we actually look at the poor systematic reviews that, that in fact actually give us an overview since the 80s to 2012, we see that the story hasn't changed much, right? We're at around 40% of studies using an independent measure of proficiency. And again, as I want to further emphasize that within the independent measures that have been employed, there is quite a bit of variation. We, we've seen existing, existing standardized tests, closed tests, et cetera. In fact, in the four presentations that we saw this morning, I think that we had four different ways of personalizing proficiency already, which again shows about the variability of methods that we do use. So I won't say the picture hasn't really changed much in, in the past 10 years. And in 2012, Lemhover and Brishma already said something that I, I quite like is, given the central role of proficiency in to research, it is alarming. And I want to emphasize the word alarming because I think that it is alarming how little consensus there is in how we measure it. Especially so if we're then going to take a step back and compare our own studies against each other, how do we know that what we're talking about is the same thing or that we have got participants within the same levels? And I think that that is quite important. Back then, with uh, the uh, Lemhover and Brishma proposed the Lextel as a measure of vocabulary knowledge, and that is important, right? Although, as we'll see in a second, uh, the Lextel has been used as a measure of global proficiency, that was not their, general, th their initial intention. The initial intention was to provide a measure of vocabulary knowledge of uh, le lexical capacity and so on. And they already emphasized after their study that potentially, and they emphasized the word potentially, the Lextel could be a good measure of global proficiency in SLA studies. So what is the Lextel? I mean, uh, of course, please feel free to read the original paper where they explain everything or look at their website that you can access it and take it uh, yourself. But basically, the, Le the Lextel is a yes-no lexical decision task. It consists of 60 items, 40 words and 20 non-words. Items are taken from an unpublished vocabulary size test called the uh, 10K from Miara 1996. And all items are between four and 12 letters long with mean of 7.3. And then there are the words that are uh, uh, spread across different categories and the non-words follow the phonotactics and orthographical conventions of English. And importantly, uh, as Lemhover uh, mentions in their original paper, they do not correspond to any Dutch or Korean words. And that's relevant because those are the L1s of their participants. We've checked for that and they do not correspond to Spanish or Chinese words either, which will be relevant for our study. You can see if you take the test yourself and certainly welcome you to encourage you all to do it. It takes, takes about three and a half minutes. So really quick, very convenient for SLA research. It gives you the introductions. You see a word, yes, no, and you do need to decide whether it is a word or not. And then depending on your scoring, you'll get a percentage of lexical knowledge, so to say. But I guess the question is, has the reliability of the Lextel been explored as a measure of global proficiency? Well, the first study to do so was the one in which this was proposed. Then Hover and Brishman tested uh, 72 Dutch uh, speakers of English and 87 Korean speakers of English. They uh, focused on highly advanced uh, participants to make sure that the Dutch and Korean groups uh, were, had comparable proficiencies. They just included Korean speakers who had a 750 or above in the TOEIC score, which if you are familiar with this test, that would be a C1 kind of C2 level of proficiency, so fairly advanced. They had five different measures. They did the Lextel, an L1 to L2 translation, an L2 to L1 translation, the Oxford Quick Placement Test as a kind of valid standardized measure of global proficiency. And then they also asked for their self ratings of English proficiency. And they looked at the correlations between these measures. Very briefly, the correlation between the Lextel, that's what we're interested in, and the Oxford Quick Placement Test was uh, fairly high, uh, following the Pearson's uh, co coefficient, correlation coefficient, 0.63, that's a fairly high correlation indicating that for the Dutch participants, the Lextel did correlate nicely with the scores in the Oxford Quick Placement Test. For the L2 Korea, for the L1 Korean speakers, the correlation which was much lower, indicating that L1 had an effect and linguistic distance between the L1 and L2 did influence the correlation of the Lextel. Uh, they also 
presented some correlations between ratings and Oxford Quick Placement Test. And in fact, actually, the picture is better for self-based, so, so self self, mean self-ratings of proficiency, whereby correlations were indeed actually higher for both groups. Notice we were at 70, 74 uh, uh, co coefficient for the Dutch speakers and for, uh, 40 for the Korean speakers. So perhaps the picture is not so bad for mean ratings, but I can, I can talk about that a bit later as well. Following up, Nakata and colleagues in 2020 published as well a study, a very similar study where they assessed the reliability of the Lexdale. And what they did was they tested 111 Japanese speakers. Uh, their TOEFL score was 502.90. That was the mean average score that would correspond to B1, B2 level. So the first indication of the, their proficiency being slightly lower in this study. Four different measures, Lexdale, translation task, vocabulary size test and self ratings again. And what the results show for this group is a much lower correlation, similar to that of the Korean speakers in the first study, but very much lower than that of the Dutch participants. So again, I think that this is already telling us that linguistic distance will play a role and potentially actual proficiency might also. And we will get back to that. Again, the, cor the correlation for the self ratings was not the same. So that's a typo was slightly lower in this case. And I, I'll link my results back to, to these two studies later on. So now I get to what I've done. With, with, there are two parts moving on. There's a kind of systematic review of how the Lextel has been used to date in the past 10 years. And then an empirical study, a semi-replica of the Lenhover and Brishma study that I want to present. So the, the systematic review that we conducted was last updated in March 27, 2022. Uh, we did a search follow using Google Scholar, ab abstract ProQuest, connected papers, so on and so forth. We used keywords like uh, keywords like Lextail and the actual citation, which gave us a total of 787, 787 studies, which were then coded by three very talented undergraduate students. I, I would have not been able to go through every single study and code it myself, so they did, did help. Yara Charles, Lisa Loy, and, and, and Julia as well. In terms of the coding procedure, what we did was we first coded for whether the leg cell had been only cited or actually used in the experimental design. We thought that that was important. We also coded for the language, the L1 of the participants used in the study to see whether the, the type of uh, L1s that the leg cell had been used with. The level of the participants in the study, we, we, we wanted to know whether been, it had been used with advanced learners or pre-advanced. And I use pre-advanced to just get the whole picture here from beginner to whatever pre-advanced means, right? And I'll just say something on that in a second. And then we had the target domain, whether they'd been looking at phonology, vocabulary, syntax, semantics, vocabulary acquisition, pragmatics, et cetera. And then whether they had actually found, whether a specific study had actually found an effect of proficiency or not. We'll focus on these three today. In terms of use, what you see is an explosion of use of the Lextail. You can see the number of times the Lextail has been cited within the past 10 years. Some of you might now be saying, well, hold on a second. You're, we're talking about citations. How about actual use? We, we see actually a parallel picture where there's simply an explosion of studies using the Lexel as a measure of global proficiency. I mean, I've got my, my intuitions of why that is the case, right? It's a very short and efficient way of using. I myself have used it. So it's just very convenient for all of us, right? But I think it's worrying to think that, all, that its reliability hasn't really been looked at. The languages that uh, have been used, the Lexa has been used with 31 different L1s, so quite a variety of languages. You've got the examples here, Arabic, Basque, Chinese, Dutch, so on and so forth. And crucially, however, the L1s are not equally distributed, right? What we do see is that the vast, there's almost 30% of studies that have used L1 Dutch, perhaps not surprisingly. Then we've got German, Chinese, Spanish, French, Portuguese, and then all the other languages, right? So we, there is a clear uh, bias towards Indo-European languages, perhaps with the exception of Chinese there, and then all others. But I guess that we need uh, much more st studies here. In terms of the level, and that, that was surprising to me because the Lexel is not, the Lexel is designed for advanced learners uh, in the name of the test already. 
explicitly mentioned, but the vast, the vast majority of studies that have used it actually use pre-advanced, at least one group of pre-advanced learners, right? What we do see is that 11% of the studies target per advanced participants only. To me, that's worry, worrisome, right? Because the Lexel was never designed for, for groups that are not advanced. But that just goes to say, if the, sometimes that we just take things for granted, I would say. And I think that for me, this was an exercise of taking a step back and say, hey, what am I using and how am I using it, right? And then there's 89% studies that contain at least one group of what I call pre-advanced learners. I operationalized it as, as to whether researchers had used different labels other than advanced and whether they had a, a score lower than 80% in the Lextel. So that's what we've got, what we know, how it's been used. Again, I want to say that the, the, the whole point of this study actually came after someone pointed out that I should have used the Lexel in one of my studies because it would have been more time efficient. I, I, I made my, the participants in my dissertation, uh, I made them take the Oxford Quick Placement Test, which took them about 40 minutes, ultimately to say nothing about my, my study because they were all beginner learners, right? So they say, well, perhaps you could have used the Lextel. I was like, could I really? And that's what got me going with this. So uh, w uh, the study entertains the following uh, interrelated questions. Is the Lextel a valid measure? Does linguistic uh, distance matter? And does level of proficiency matter, right? And they did a background questionnaire, the Lextel and the Oxford Quick Placement Test background questionnaire, we, we gathered all sorts of information, background information, information regarding their linguistic profile, their current studies, so on and so forth. We also asked for their self-rated self proficiency to explore whether that would actually tell us something. And then they did the Lextail, as we've seen already. And then they did the Oxford Quick Placement Test because it, it's a, a standardized test that's been tested over a thousand participants. It has multiple versions. We adapted the pen and paper one onto a web-based format that was done through Ibex Farm and Qualtrics. It's got 60 multiple choice question. And crucially, importantly for us, it's got a standardized scoring procedure against the CEFR that would allow us to actually classify our participants into whether they were advanced or intermediate le learners. We targeted two groups of participants, L1 Chinese, L2 English. We started off with 343 participants for the Chinese group though I will only present data from 278 because we excluded beginners. I can tell you more about that if you want in the questions. And then we've got, L, we had L1 Spanish, L2 English speakers. Again, we started off with 279. We ended up including 242 participants. So very briefly, the results of the Oxford Quick Placement Test. So the first thing to say is that we used it to classify our participants into whether they were beginner or uh, intermediate or advanced. We used the standardized scoring procedure. And you can see here in the violin plot that, they, of course, the, the, the results are quite neat, but that's because this test was used to categorize them. We've got intermediate participants with lower proficiency than advanced participants, as we would expect. I'm going to report data from these four levels. Then we've got the results of the legs tail. And what we already see is that it shows much more variation across groups, right? Because we're using that categorization in the first task to examine the legs tail. And that already tells us that an intermediate participant could score at 100% accuracy in the legs tail. And we'll explore that further. So there does not seem to be a clear distinction for those in the intermediate group. And we'll explore this in a second. A very quick note on correlations. I know that most of you are familiar, but in case we've got students or people in the audience that are not, what I'll do is I'll present scatter plots on the x-axis. I'll always plot the Lextel score. In the y-axis, I'll plot the Oxford Quick Placement Test score. And what we will do is we'll interpret uh, the, the linear regression as a kind of positive correlation, negative correlation. And then we've got, that's how we'll interpret. We'll interpret Pearson's correlation coefficient as below 30 as a low, between 30 and 50 as moderate, and above 50 as high. And we'll do the, the we'll now look at the, Oops, sorry, something just came up here. So those are the results. In terms of the overall look, what we do see is that there is a moderate correlation between the Lex test score and the Oxford Quick Placement Test of 0.37 when we don't take into account L1 or proficiency, as you can see here. So there is a moderate correlation. When we look at the, the, the scores by L1, so with the 
with orange, we've got the Spanish group, and in black, we've got the Chinese group. What we do see is that there is a slightly higher correlation of 0.40, but still moderate correlation, right? That's for the Chinese group. And in fact, contrary to our expectations, a lower correlation for the Spanish group. We've got a 0.27, so it's a low correlation where we see that for the Spanish group. When we look at the, result, the results by proficiency group, what we actually see, again, you see in red, you see the advanced participants. In blue here, uh, you would see the intermediate participants. What we do see is that the correlation for the intermediate participants is very low at 0.19, right? Indicating that it doesn't quite work with intermediate learners. And I'll, 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 I'm not surprised about this because it was never intended to do so, right? When we look at the advanced, the picture is not as nice as I was hoping it to be. It's at a point 30 when we only look at the advanced, which again, if we think of the results in Lemhover's study, that was at a 67, the correlation was a 0.67, right, for the Dutch participants, right? So here is actually quite low. So our results as a whole show that there is a moderate correlation for the L1 Chinese group, slightly higher for the L1 Korea Korean participants in the Lemhover and Brishma study. There is a low correlation for the L1 Spanish group, much lower than the L1 Dutch participants in the same study, but Dutch and English are Germanic languages, Spanish isn't, perhaps that's telling us something about that. There is a stronger moderate correlation for in the advanced uh, participants and a low one for the intermediate participants, which provides further evidence for Nakata's and colleagues' explanations of the results, that the Lexel does not quite work with intermediate learners, so the Lextail in the original study was shown to be a very good predictor for vocabulary size, especially in advanced participants and especially so for the Dutch participants, right? So we need to use the Lextail core score with caution when we infer things about general global proficiency. And I think that that's been the problem in the literature, that we've taken the Lextail to be something that was never meant to be. Especially so, and even more importantly, when we look at pre-advanced participants, right? Because the correlation was really low with intermediate learners. It's even lower and inexistent with beginner learners. I, I haven't presented the data, but we've explored that. So I guess some of you might be wondering, okay, so are you telling us not to use it? Well, no, right? Let's do whatever we think is best in our studies. We might want to use it if we want to guarantee that our groups are comparable, right? If we want to have, they've got the same vocabulary size, but then let's use them. We might want to use the, Lex, the score in the Lextel to create groups of participants who differ in vocabulary size. As Lemhover proposes, perhaps we can create two groups and that might be, te be telling us something about our studies. Perhaps we might want to use the score to create two groups of participants differing in vocabulary size, which I've already said. Or perhaps uh, the, the third point should say, perhaps we want to use the, the Lextel as a kind of a screening tool to say, okay, we only want advanced participants. Let's first screen them with the leg tail and then let's test them on something else. If we need to talk about proficiency, perhaps we don't need to be talking about proficiency so much if it is not relevant for our own studies. So I guess the point or take home message of the presentation is let's just be careful with the tools we use and the terminology we use to talk about them. Yes, we may want to use the leg tail, but we need to know what the leg tail is telling. So I guess the next step is to explore the self-rating data, which I didn't have time to present, but shows perhaps a bit of a stronger correlation than the one for the Lextel. Perhaps the stigma we've got with self-ratings is unjustified based on some empirical data. And perhaps I'm saying something I shouldn't be saying, but I guess there is an empirical question ultimately. On that note, I just want to acknowledge the participants that were uh, from the Xi'an Jiatong University, uh, University of Liverpool in Shanghai, and Universidad de Granada, and some of the funding we got from King's College. And if people do have questions, uh, we'll very much appreciate that, especially so because we're now deciding whether we're going to write this up and whether it's worth for us to just put it out there. Uh, yeah, so feedback will be very much welcome. Thank you.